rescue car to the address of your emergency. Um, I'm at the gate gas station. Shots fired in the parking lot. Two black males stepped out. Came from the red SUV. I don't know if they were trying to stash something. The person driving the vehicle was the one shooting out of the vehicle. It was like pop, 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 pop. Second air, pop, 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 pop. <laughs> Michael Dunn, he's being charged with shooting and killing 17-year-old Jordan Davis. The confrontation began over loud music. Was there music playing in the car? Yes. What type of music? Rap. Did the defendant say anything about the music? Oh, I hate that thug music. Thug is the new N-word. We've just seen four black kids. I'm not racist. They're racist. Michael Dunn is claiming self-defense. Jordan Davis threatened Michael Dunn. Because you're dead, bitch. I look, and I'm looking at a barrel. This is about the right of everyone to protect themselves, to protect their family. Under the law, it's justified. I said, you're not going to kill me, you son of a bitch. There's no weapons in that car. Could have been just a stick. Could have been your imagination. It certainly... Uh, well, no. I mean, anything's possible, I guess. Maybe they didn't have a gun, but he thought they had a gun. They think it's a gun when it's in the hands of a young African-American. Trayvon Martin's father texts me, I just want to welcome you to a club that none of us want to be in. It's going to be open season. Open you can season say later on, on who? It's time to pick up where Dr. Don't King left off. Got this. I've never covered a trial with this much international attention. This was a 21st century lynching. Was he all right to kill my son? What happened to Jordan? What happened to Jordan? Thanks, everybody. Guys, thank you so much for being here. It is an honor to talk to you again. Um, we had the chance to talk at Sundance this year, and I think we had a 45-minute conversation. You were supposed to be there for about 10. I just couldn't stop talking to you. Um, but let's, let's go back. Let's uh, recount the film. Mark, it's an incredibly powerful, powerful film. You had access to footage. You shot some footage. It's just unbelievable. But I want to go back to uh, Jordan, and not when you found out what had happened, but when you found out what Michael Dunn's defense was going to be, what, were your, what was your first thought? How could it be self-defense? How could it be self-defense when the boys are unarmed, they're not doing anything wrong but being teenage boys? How could it be self-defense over music, loud music? Um... And at that point, I didn't really even thoroughly understand that kind of defense with Stand Your Ground. Of course, we knew um, about Trayvon Martin's case. We knew that Stand Your Ground was kind of used at the, as the self-defense in that case as well, but still not really understanding thoroughly what self-defense in Stand Your Ground meant. So... Very, I was very complex, very confused for a while. And it's stand your ground is essentially that you imagine a threat, right? You perceive a threat, so therefore you have the right to, quote, stand your ground. And his perception of a threat in this situation was he saw four black kids listening to music. And that, in his mind, was a, was a threat, essentially. And the American right. justice system, or at least the justice system in Florida, right. was like, yeah, right. that's a trial. That's essentially what it, what it was, right? Right. Well, you know, again, he got there, and within seconds, he said to his girlfriend, I hate that thug music, which is the new N-word, you know? And so you profile the children right away without knowing anything. They couldn't be college graduates with PhDs. You don't know anything, you know? But that's what we have now in America going across America. You have that situation in Cleveland, same thing. Two people, their car gets shot with 137 shots to a car because they thought that they had a gun. And the policeman jumped on the hood of the car and took out his Glock and shot 16 bullets in the face of two individuals and killed them. We have this all across America where we have to finally come out and say black lives matter because we know that white lives matter to given. But now we have to say that people of color 
we do matter in this country because of the bias that people have in their mind, like Michael Dunn. He had a bias against Jordan and those poor kids in the car. Well, he had a, a cultural bias in the sense that he perceived black people as, as a threat of some kind, which is not just Michael Dunn. It's, mm-hmm. it's, 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 our, it's our culture in general. Mark, how did you um, get involved with this film? How did you get started? Um, a producer had previously written to uh, Lucy and Ron expressing that she wanted to make this film. Uh, and then uh, we spoke about that. And then we spent about a week together uh, two years ago um, just talking about Jordan's life, what obviously had happened, um, and looked at the way that you can construct a film and also how that film can actually maybe inspire some change when it comes to self-defense laws, gun control issues, and as you said, like perception of young black men. And it, it has inspired change. We're seeing a lot of change. But do you think that this, this trial, um, I mean, didn't get the attention that maybe it deserved because Michael Dunn was found guilty? I mean, I would probably prefer that he get found guilty than for it to be getting more attention. But do you feel like you you know it's not getting as much attention as it maybe deserves since it speaks to so many problems? Mm-hmm. And we've actually had people kind of insinuate to us that we weren't really part of the Black Lives Matter movement at times because we did receive justice, which was, <laughs> you know, how can you say that to us? Because there's... Uh, a miscarriage of justice in what happened through the through both trials, even though we did receive justice, the miscarriage of justice is that we had to fight for so long, even though we had witnesses and testimony to bear witness to the fact that the boys were being just regular teenage boys and did nothing wrong. So that's that's the miscarriage of the justice that we had to fight in the system to prove the innocence of our children. But also on the surface, uh, the film might have this kind of happy ending in the sense that Michael Dunn was found guilty, but there's nothing nothing to celebrate in the film. Um, And also the the whole idea of the Black Lives Matter hashtag isn't just about uh, whether justice is served or not. I think you have to take a step back and actually look at why Michael Dunn behaved in that way. That's, you know, really what the hashtag Black Lives Matter is about. Absolutely. Um, Talk to me about Jordan. Uh, let's go back and let's talk about who Jordan was. Because for many reasons, one of them, we, we've spoken about this before, you weren't really allowed to talk about who Jordan was during the trial. Jordan was very, very playful. Liked to dance, did a little silly dance that the teenagers do, you know, and he called it the chef dance where he would move his hand like he's cooking. And he would do that. You know, tried to play basketball with his friends and always missed a shot but never stopped trying. You know, and that's the thing about Jordan. He never stopped trying whatever he's trying to do. Uh, I'm from New York, originally born and bred in New York, grew up in Queens, New York. And uh, I taught him how to be special about all nationalities, you know. So all of his friends were were different nationalities. So he didn't grow up with this kind of bias that maybe some other people that are narrow-minded grow up with. And so his friends were from different nationalities. And Jordan just really didn't believe that there are people out here that are white supremacists, you know. I tell people there's a difference. I said, Jordan, you know, there are people that that are good, And it doesn't matter whether you're Irish, Italian, Jewish, whatever you are. I said, but they're white supremacists. There's a whole difference of people. And I said, you have to be careful how you talk. And I think in the film, uh, when you look at three and a half minutes, you'll see there's a shot of me in the swimming pool. And I said that I know Jordan is apologizing to me because I told Jordan that you can't talk to everybody like you talk to your friends. You know, there are people out here that have serious problems in the world. And if you say the same thing you would say to a normal human being, it would be okay. But just like in this film, Michael Dunn made a decision. He didn't have to kill Jordan. He made a decision to kill Jordan. Same thing with the gentleman that pulled up to the car next to the the kids. He decided he didn't want to hear the music, so he pulled into another parking space. And he said, that's some pretty good music out there, but I just didn't want to hear it. He made a decision. So Jordan, I said, Make sure that when you have fun with your friends and you go out and play that there are people in the world, especially adults, that you have to take care and make sure of the things that you say to them. John was a great kid. He loved his family. We loved him. And he always brightened us like during the Thanksgiving. The day before that was Thanksgiving. And he prayed with us, and he actually led the prayer during Thanksgiving. And he received the Lord and said that I'm going to call all my friends. And he called dozens of his friends as if he had a premonition 
that something was going to happen because it was so unusual that he would call friends he hadn't talked to in months. He called them all on Thanksgiving the day before he was murdered. Lucy, talk about, um, we just heard all about Jordan, but how you couldn't present any of Jordan's personality or who Jordan was during the trial and what it was like to watch the defense do that for Michael Dunn. It was so disheartening because we knew from the very beginning, once we were given those instructions, we felt like Jordan and the boys would be demonized, just as Trayvon Martin had been in their trial, in the Zimmerman trial. When you don't allow the character of the victim to be expressed, then that leaves just open in your window uh, for the individuals that are understanding and learning the, the dynamics of the case, they can believe and think whatever they want about the victim, and the victim is dead. So who's there to refute what the victim is, who the victim is? And so to be told as we're sitting there that so that we won't slant the jurors in any way, that anything about Jordan's personality or who he was as an individual or show pictures with family and friends to show his character. We're not going to be allowed. That was very, very painful because it felt like we were fighting for Jordan, but we were having to take him out of the fight. And we were left standing there fighting for him because he wasn't allowed to exist to the jurors. He becomes a concept, whereas Michael exactly. Dunn becomes a human being. Exactly. And I think, again, that challenges, that goes back to challenging something that Ron is talking about, which is challenging a certain amount of supremacy, right? I mean, when people talk about white supremacy, I think they think of white nationalists or they think of swastikas and they think of prison gangs or something. But when we talk about white supremacy, what we're actually talking about is someone like Michael Dunn who thinks to himself, how dare you speak to me that way? Right. And that's, go ahead, Mark. And he, I mean, yes, and also the fact that he doesn't even perceive himself as racist. That's what I thought was most amazing. And accuses the boys of actually being racist to him. And then we, that's right, in the phone calls, he says that he's the victim. They were being racist towards him. But then there's also uh, evidence, or not necessarily evidence, but there was when he was in prison, phone calls, letters that he wrote that showcased an even further depth of racism that, that, that we didn't know was there, right? Yeah, and I think um, that's why Michael Dunn, from, in film terms, was such an interesting character that you could, you could show that this, you know, to, in his eyes, this crazy event had happened. He just acted in self-defense. Why is everyone having a go at me? Um, there should be a protest for my side rather than Jordan's side. Um, and then to see him or to hear through his phone calls who he actually was and then to see him on the stand express what happened that day during the film, he kind of slowly digs his own grave towards his own demise and then ends up obviously with a, with a life sentence at the end of the film. But even then, actually believes that he potentially saved some other people's lives by killing Jordan. When incidents like this happen, which is far too uh, often than, than they should happen, um, whether it's Walter Scott, whether it's Ferguson, when a young black man or a black man is killed at the hands of the law or at the hands of a stand your ground law, it becomes a, a culture war. It becomes a political divide rather than something that is just sort of discussing the death of a young man and, and how it happened. When Jordan died and the trial began and it began to get a lot of media coverage, were you surprised, were you shocked to see the way some people were talking about it on the conservative right? Well, you know, one thing I never got was death threats, you know, which I thought was unusual because <laughs> I was pretty outspoken. You were expecting death threats? Uh, yeah, because I was very outspoken. I mean, you know, as a father, you know, to, to have to bury your son, it's the worst nightmare you could ever continue to live on and on. And I, I just couldn't wait to get my hands on Michael Dunn, I'll tell you the truth, you know. And so the things that I was saying... Uh, pretty inflammatory at the time, you know, but I, I just, you know, but I, I pointed it toward Michael Dunn, not a race of people. And I think the mistake that a lot of families, I talked to Mike Brown and Ferguson and a lot of these other families, I actually talked to Walter Scott's family also, is that point it in the direction of the person that did it. Don't indict a group of people for something that one person did to you because I don't want black people to hold up a store and kill somebody and then white people look at me because I'm black and, and indict me because of that. So you don't do it, you know, racism goes two ways, you know. So I didn't want to do that. 
But I, I just think that in our case at the beginning of the trial that when you get the stations that are national stations, national networks are interested in the story, that's a big shock to you because, again, it was on the heels of the Trayvon Martin, and I thought they kind of had enough of that because they played that to the fullest. But I think because of Jordan, Jordan touched some hearts. You know, I felt that Jordan, every time that we went to the other stations and the other moderators, you know, everybody seemed touched by it. I mean, we have anchors like you that were crying. They were actually saying, you know, we feel that it wasn't just a black kid. It was an American kid. It was a kid that could have been my nephew. It could have been my grandson. It could have been my kid. And I think that's what's touched the story about Jordan all through this nation is that they felt that Jordan didn't do drugs. Jordan didn't have alcohol in his system. Jordan was just a normal, middle-class American kid. And if that could happen for playing loud music to him, then it could touch any of us in any of our lives. And so I think that's why it got such a review. And I think that's why Mark took this on, because Mark, he said that he was very, very much touched by Jordan, even not, not even meeting Jordan, but meeting his parents and knowing Jordan through us and listening to us tell and talk about Jordan, it really touched his heart. Uh, just to go back for a second, I find it devastating that, for lack of a better phrase, we live in a country where you had to bury your son and then because of the particular circumstance or the context of the situation, as a black man who had to bury his son, you were expecting death threats from people in this country, that we couldn't just leave a man be. Just, just, like, just like Michael Dunn said at the end of this film, he said, well, if I didn't kill Jordan, maybe somebody else, he would have tried to kill somebody else. Just the thought that he was doing a public service by killing Jordan. You know, he, he just felt that if, if, if I didn't do it, some, Jordan might have killed somebody, so it was, it was good that I did it. And he didn't think enough of Jordan even to dial 911. Lucy, you, you, you've become an incredible advocate now at this point, or activist, excuse me. You've become an incredible activist, the both of you have. When did you realize that you were going to have to take on that role, that it meant something for you to take on that role? Sitting there in the courtroom um, as I was journaling, and I had already begun to speak out during, you know, both trials, but particularly at the end of the, ver the, end of the second trial, as I'm journaling, because we're not allowed to show any emotion in the courtroom so that we would not sway the jurors. And for me, the only way I could express my anger and my rage and the pain that we were going through is to journal it. And so as I'm journaling, I just really begin to understand, okay, Father, okay, Lord, then this is it. This is what you have for me to do. This is the, the pattern for my life. In this outraged moment, I feel this anger and this pain, and I am I'm just going to take the rest of my life to fight this very thing, to make sure that these kinds of things don't continue to happen to other families and other children. And every time there's another case, and every time I see something else on television, and it's weekly now, it's weekly, it just, it, it puts a fire in my gut that just, if we do nothing, we are part of the problem. And at that point, where's our humanity as a nation if we can sit by and watch this continue again and again and again? And the sad thing about it is that this has been happening in the black communities all along. It's just now being exposed. And so as the, the gun violence goes beyond the ghetto and goes beyond the minority communities and is now affecting all communities, we have to do something about this. This is almost the annihilation of us as a, a sense of, in, in a sense of humanity as, as Americans. And that's not the reason why people immigrate from all over the world to come here. They come to be free, to walk freely on the streets without the fear of gun violence, to be educated where, the, where they want to be educated, to live where they want to live, to love who they want to love. And we have a moral responsibility to care about what we see happening in the country. And it must be um, incredible every day to be an activist like this. But at the same time, this sort of goes into what Trayvon Martin's father said to you when, he got, when you got the call, right? 
Yeah, he welcomed me into the circle of fathers, which are fathers that have gone through this kind of tragedy where their children are being murdered. And he welcomed me, and then I had to welcome Walter Scott's family when his son was killed in North Charleston, South Carolina, where he's running from the policeman, a 50-year-old man trying to run, hopping more than running. And they shoot him in the back six times, and they take a taser and place it next to his body like, like it was his taser that he was fighting. That was one of the most disgusting yeah. things ever shown yeah. on television before. That, yeah. And there were still people right. who, so have, who have media platforms, who yeah. have networks behind them, who felt running. comfortable saying, oh, yeah, exactly, he ran away. Shouldn't Maybe he did away. try to get the taser. Right. You know, and the fact that, that, that that's even, sure, I believe in freedom of speech, but the fact that that's allowed right. is unbelievable to me. Right. These things, you know, I speak, when I go speak, I was at the uh, United Nations in August. They asked me to come to the United Nations Conference in Geneva, Switzerland, and I spoke about that and what happened in Ferguson and also mass incarceration. The things that we're doing right here in this city, uh, I was out yesterday with the New York Justice League, and we're down at the Manhattan House of Detention, and we had a vigil out there for Khalif, and he was just, he just hung himself because he was waiting on trial at Rikers Island. I don't know if you heard about it here in Rikers Island, oh. waiting on trial, and they had him three years waiting for trial. I mean, that's a sentence, and, and they abused him and raped him in prison. So when he, he got out, spent, he ended up... He also, not to interrupt, he yeah. also spent uh, the majority of his time in, in solitary confinement, yeah. I believe. He was incarcerated at Rikers. With no trial, he was beaten, he was raped, as you said, and he spent most of his time in solitary confinement. He came out, he was on The View, he was on HuffPost Live. He spoke about solitary confinement mainly. He spoke about the injustices uh, that, he, that he witnessed, that were the injustices that were put upon him. And after a little while, he really couldn't take it anymore, and, and he hung himself. Ended up hung, hung himself in his family's home, and I was out there yesterday with a vigil for him. And, and, you know, we have things right here in New York at Rikers Island that, you know, you have 60% of the people awaiting trial, and they've been there for months and months and months. And how would you like to spend six, seven, eight months of your life just waiting to be found innocent of something that somebody accused you of? And so, again, this film speaks to the families of victims of all type of violence, whether it be violence because of gun laws, whether it be violence, actual violence, the way Jordan was killed, because there's all types of violence. But... We want to show the devastation that it has on the families that try to navigate themselves through the justice system. And I hope when you come out and see this film, you see some of the hardships that me and Lucy have done trying to help Jordan and, and show Jordan was a victim of this. The court even said that we couldn't call Jordan a victim after three bullets to the chest, him coughing up blood, trying to breathe, and choking on his own blood. The judge had the nerve to stare in me and Lucy's face and say, we cannot call Jordan a victim. Unbelievable. Uh, let's take some questions. Does anyone have any questions? Folks, someone's got a question here. Right here, right in the front. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, actually, horrible what I hear. And I feel you guys because uh, I felt some, something like this a long time ago. But um, actually, I had like a happy question <laughs> for Mark. I wanted to ask you, obviously, you have a great talent, and uh, thank you for what you're doing. But um, are there any guardian angels through all your life that help you to contribute to the success and what you're doing right now, and maybe how, except... Uh, Lucy and Ron. Yeah, Lucy and Rob. <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think I have any guardian angels looking over me, but, um, but I just think that, uh, you know, the camera and the media is a very powerful tool, and you can choose how to use that tool. And, I, you know, I choose to use it to uh, try and uh, kind of break down barriers and create more empathy between people in the hope that that creates more understanding between people and... Uh, tries to almost bring down these um, constructed labels that we all walk around with. Uh, that's, that's how I'm interested in using the camera. Going back to Khalif Brother for a second, I think there are some people who would say, well, those stories don't uh, go together. They don't really have anything in common. He wasn't tried, and, 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 and you got justice. 
Can you explain? I, I, I don't necessarily feel that way. <laughs> Can you explain how those two cases are connected? Well, how you believe that they're connected? Well, because they both attest to systemic racism. I mean, that's plain and simple. Um, and just how we view young black males stereotypically in this country. Um, and it just also brings to light again, even as far as we think we've evolved as a nation, we still have a whole lot of work to do. And that if even in this day and age, we're dealing with Trayvon Martins, Jordan Davises, Eric Garners, Mike Browns, <laughs> what did we do in the civil rights era? Was that for nothing? Was it absolutely for nothing that we're still at this point now with these two types of cases dealing with these very opinions and, and trains of thoughts and, and, and ideas about people that don't look, think, or act like you? There's a lot of similarity in both the cases. I think that was actually something we were very uh, sensitive of when we were cutting the film. Um, we didn't bring up any other cases in the film, um, even though they were kind of unfolding on the news as we were editing. And I think um, I can understand that if you choose to, uh, you can disassociate and find disconnections between all those different cases if you have like the political motivation to do that. Um, but I also think that you would be extremely ignorant to not understand that the DNA of all these cases is the same, and that is essentially in the moment where you had the choice whether to shoot or not, whoever it was, in whatever circumstance, um, the reason you chose to shoot was connected to your perception of those young black men, and that's why they're all connected, and, and, it's, it's, and it should be impossible to disconnect them. And it's why Black Lives Matter is so important at that point, because you're sort of trying to recreate the DNA there, trying to make sure that people understand that there is no supremacy. Black lives matter, okay? When you have the, when you have the thought to shoot or not shoot, you think not shoot. And, and, the, and the idea that that perception is um, overtly and covertly constructed um, and we're all conditioned by uh, that construction. And that is, I think, what um, certainly what we tried to do in the film was make audiences or invite audiences to reflect on how potentially they consciously or subconsciously carry some of those biases and how it, it might not lead to somebody being shot, but um, you should still be checking um, how you perceive other people. Guys, uh, before I let you go, how can people keep up with, with you and what you're doing for Jordan and what you're doing for our, uh, other families? My website is uh, walkwithjordan.org. If you go to walkwithjordan.org, you can find us and, and keep up with what we're doing. And uh, I just want to say I want to commend New York City because they asked me to come up here when they had the day of protest, which was December 13th, and had a Black Lives Matter, had almost 50,000 people shut down Broadway. I was asked to come up and help lead that. And one of the things that I want to point out about that is that a lot of the news people didn't, didn't point out is that the people that were out there shouting Black Lives Matter, over 60% of the people were white with their children. White children, white people saying Black Lives Matter. It wasn't a black protest. It wasn't a black march. It was everybody's march. And so I'm so proud of my city, New York, to go out and no matter whether you're black or not, to come out and say to everybody, hey, my friend, my buddy, Black Lives Matter. Doesn't matter what color I am. Black Lives Matter. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We have uh, one last question before we wrap up. Wrap up. Brad here has a question. Um, I, I have a question from Periscope. Um, in several of, of these situations, we've seen protests that, you were, that you're speaking of, but we also see people who seem to take advantage of the protests and protest for the wrong reasons, loot and destroy businesses, How, what, what are your response to those people who, who do that? I know right away, me and Lucy decided, right after Jordan was killed, we got calls from Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. We turned them down twice. The reason why, you don't need mouthpieces to lead what you have to say. If that's your child, who knows your child better than you, right? 
When, when people in the audience on television, they see your hurt and your pain coming out of a parent's mouth, they'd rather see that than see these so-called leaders walk around and spouting about a kid that they've never met before. And then all of a sudden you got people coming in from out of town and trying to create havoc and robbing and looting. That takes away from what you want to talk about. We want to talk about Jordan, about our child. We don't want you to rob nobody. We don't want you to burn down a store. We don't want you to take away somebody's livelihood. We don't want you to beat cops that had nothing to do with it over the head. You know, we want to talk about how we're going to make the laws better for our son, for Jordan. And so I always tell parents, when these things happen, get out in front, find your voice, and not let these people from out of town come and speak for you. And just always, it's a matter of exposing the truth. And whatever is your reality and your truth, you don't ever want anyone to take that from you and to make it anything else. You don't want them to transform that and make it their own. It has to stay real. And so that is the reason why we have handled our walk with Jordan the way that we've handled it because we wanted the truth and the reality of our existence to be told by no one else but us. Absolutely. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.